Question number one says, on the set of axes below, segment AB is dilated by a scale factor of 5 halves centered at point P. Which statement is always true? Option number one says that uh, segment PA is congruent to AA prime. And I know that looking at this, that this green right here is much smaller than AA prime. So we can rule that out. If we didn't know that, we could simply use the distance formula, but I'm going to knock option one off as a possible answer. Let's take a look at option two. It says that uh, segment AB is parallel to A prime, B prime, and it sure does look like that. So uh, what do I know? I know that a segment, a line segment, when dilated from a point, um, is always parallel to its image. And if I didn't know that, if I looked in, uh, looked at the segment a little bit more closely, I can see that the slope is two down, one over, two down, one over for a slope of negative two. And if we look at a prime, b prime, I can see that similarly down two over one, down two over one. So they share the same slope. They're definitely parallel. Option two is probably the correct answer. Let's Take a look at uh, options three and four. And option three says that uh, AB is congruent. I'm sorry, AB is equal to A prime, B prime. And I know that visually uh, this is significantly smaller than uh, this. We could apply the distance formula if needed, but we can easily rule out option three. Option four says five halves times A prime, B prime um, is equal to AB. And no, that's also not the case. 5 halves times AB equals A prime, B prime. So we can rule out option 4, meaning that yes, option 2 is the correct answer. Question number 2. We've got a parallelogram, CD, EH, and our objective is to determine the coordinates of P, which happens to be the intersection of diagonals CE and DH. The first thing that I would urge you guys to do is sketch out the parallelogram in itself and then think back to what we know about the diagonals of a parallelogram. We remember that uh, they are segment bisectors, meaning that they intersect at the midpoint of each diagonal, right? And so there's two ways that you can approach this problem to figure out what the coordinates of P are. You can do it sort of visually, just sketching it out, or you can do it algebraically. We're going to do both methods, but we're going to start with looking at this visually. And I know that if we need to figure out what the diagonals are, uh, I'm going to do my best to draw a line from C to E, all right, and then from H to D. And what do I know? I know that I was just sort of ballparking it, but it looks to me like the point of intersection is negative three comma two. So that looks like the, uh, the intersection. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply the midpoint formula to see if in fact that is the answer. And we remember of course, that the midpoint formula is x2 plus x1 divided by 2, comma, y2 plus y1 divided by 2. And that's going to give us a coordinate. So what we need to do is plug in um, either h, or h and d or c and e to figure out, again, what that midpoint is. And I'll do c and e. And so let's do that quickly. I can see that we've got negative 1 plus negative 5 divided by 2, comma, and then we've got negative 1 plus 5 divided by 2. And let's simplify that. It gives us negative 6 divided by 2 and 4 divided by 2. And when we simplify that further, I know that gives us simply negative 3, comma, 2. And is that what we said earlier? It sure is. Is that an option? It is an option. It's option three. Well done. Question number three. The coordinates of the endpoints of QS are negative nine, eight, and nine, negative four. Point R is on QS such that QR to RS is in the ratio of one to two. That is super duper important. And it says, what are the coordinates of point are. That's the objective. We've got to figure out what the coordinates are. How exactly do we start this pro uh, problem? I'm going to sketch out a line. And I know that on one end of this line, we've got Q. 
and I know that on the other end we've got S, and it's broken up, this segment is broken up into three congruent parts because it said a moment ago it's a ratio of one to two. Uh, our objective is to figure out what point R is, and R is going to be found right here because that is where it splits this segment into a one to two ratio. Uh, how do we figure this out now? Well, we're going to take a look at these uh, coordinates, and I'm going to jot down the x coordinates first, and I know that we've got negative nine and nine, and I know that we've got the y coordinates, which are eight and negative four. Great. Now we're going to need to figure out what the rate of change is going from Q to S. And to do that, we're going to need to figure out the distance of the X values and then the distance of the Y values. And to do that, we're going to start with uh, S and we do 9 minus negative 9, which gives us positive 18. And then we've got negative 4 minus 8, which is going to give us negative 12. All right. And now because this uh, segment's broken into three partitions, we're going to be dividing uh, both 18 and negative 12 by 3. And when we do that, negative 18 divided by 3, of course, is positive 6. And negative 12 divided by 3 is going to be negative 4. So as we're transitioning from one point to the next, we're going to be adding 6 to the x value and subtracting 4 to the y value. And so when we add 6 to negative 9, uh, we are going to get negative 3. And then when we subtract 4 from 8, we're going to get negative 4. And that is the value of r. Is that an option when we take a look? Uh, it sure is. It's option number 3. Option 3 is the coordinate of point r. Question number four. If the altitudes of a triangle meet at one of the triangle's vertices, then the triangle is a right triangle, an acute triangle, an obtuse, or an equilateral triangle. Uh, first, what I want to do is sketch out a triangle and illustrate the altitude, which we remember cuts across from one vertex and creates a 90 degree angle on the opposite side. Um, in this case, uh, the base of the, uh, the triangle. And here it's meeting on the base it's not meeting at another one of the triangle's vertices. So what would that look like? Well, I know that if we had a triangle, and this is, as we just illustrated a moment ago, this is the altitude. If it's going to be creating a 90 degree angle right here, then here's where it's going to be meeting at one of the triangle's vertices. This is the correct answer. It is a right triangle. Question number four. Question number five in the diagram below of ACD, DB is a median to segment AC. Oh, all right, so if this is the median right here, then I remember that um, AB is gonna be congruent to BC, and then it says, and segment AB is congruent to DB, so AB is congruent to DB. All right, so this is congruent to this, and this is congruent to this, and this is congruent to this. And so when I look at this, I'm recognizing that triangle ABD is an isosceles triangle, meaning that uh, the two base angles are congruent. And I also know that uh, triangle CBD is also an isosceles triangle, meaning that this angle is congruent to that angle. Amazing. And it says if DAB is 32 degrees, so where is DAB? That's right here. It's 32, and I'm going to mark that in. Okay, so if this is 32, then then what? Then what is angle B, D, C? So our objective is to figure out, okay, what angle B, D, C is. So this is our objective right here. I'm going to label it X. We're going to need to 100% uh, come back to this. So what do we know? Well, I remember that, as we said a second ago, that base angles are congruent. So if this is 32, degree, two, 32 degrees, then angle ADB has also got to be 32 degrees. And uh, let's pop that in. And I know that the sum of interior angles of a triangle is 180. So let's add 32 and 32, and that's going to give us, of course, 64. Right? And so I know that 
180, which is, again, the sum of the three interior angles, minus 64 is going to give us 116. So this angle right here is 116 degrees. And I'm recognizing that the relationship between ABD and DBC is a linear pair. And so that means that they're supplementary. So 116 plus this is going to give us 180. Alternatively, we can do 180. I'll do it like this. 180 minus 116 gives us 64. All right. Great. And so now we've got to figure out what uh, BDC is. That's the objective. And we know that BDC is the same as BCD. How are we going to do this? I know that 180 minus 64 is going to give us 116. So that's the sum of... Um, these two base angles of this isosceles triangle. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide them by 2. And when we do, that's going to give us 58 degrees. Is that an option? Is It's option number 3. Question number six, what are the coordinates of the center and the length of the radius of the circle whose equation is x squared plus y squared equals 8x minus 6y plus 39? So our objective is to figure out the coordinates of the center and the length of the radius. And we're going to need to do two things to correctly solve this problem. We're going to need to know the equation of a circle, and we're going to need to know how to um, complete the square. So what is the equation of a circle? We remember that it is open parentheses, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared, where r is the radius and hk is the center of the circle. That's great. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to um, shift all the variables over to the left side of the equal sign. So what I'm going to do right now is... I'm going to write x squared plus y squared minus 8x plus 6y equals 39. Amazing. And I'm going to rewrite this now so that the x squares, the x, or x's rather, are clumped or bunched together. Plus y squared equals, you know what, we need to leave a little gap equals 39. All right, so now what we need to do to complete the square is we need to figure out what the uh, uh, what goes in here and here, the third spot and each of these trinomials. So how do we do that? What we're going to do is we're going to take b of this trinomial, or in this case, negative 8, divided by 2, and then square. And so I'm going to jot that just in case you guys forgot. So I'm going to write b divided by 2 squared is going to give us See, that's going, what's going to go in here and here. All right, and so what do I know? x squared minus 8x. So negative 8 divided by 2 squared. So negative 8 divided by 2 is negative 4 squared is going to be positive 16. Amazing. And then we've got y plus y squared plus 6y. And uh, 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 squared is going to be positive 9 and then equals to 39 and here's what we cannot forget if we do something to one side we've always got to do it to the other so I'm going to add 16 also to the right side and I'm going to add 9 to the right side beautiful and so what do we have here we've got perfect squares here and here and so what we're going to need to do is simply factor them and that's going to look a little something like this x minus 4 squared plus and when we look at this I know that like what two numbers you guys remember this right what two numbers multiply to 9 and add to positive 6 and that of course is going to be positive 3 and because we're factoring it's uh, y plus 3 squared equals What's 39 plus 16 plus 9 is going to be 64. Great. So now what we're going to do is we need to recognize that 
Right, let's shift this over. What is the center of the circle? So HK, HK is going to be 4, negative 3, right, when we look here and here, and when we um, I think about its relationship in the equation of the circle. And then 64 is what? Well, I remember when we look at the looked at the original equation, um, this is equal to r squared. And so what could we do if r squared equals 64 and we square root both sides to isolate r? r is going to be just 8. All right, so what we're doing is we're looking for um, a center with uh, center that's 4, negative 3, and a radius of 8. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, going to be option number 4. Question number 7. In the diagram below, we have a parallelogram, A, B, C, D. And I notice in the givens, it says that CF, which is this angle right here, bisects angle DCB. All right, and let's mark this up. So if it bisects it, I know that this angle and this angle are congruent. And I also see that it says um, segment DG, which is this length right here, bisects angle ADC. All right, so we need to indicate that as well. All right, beautiful. Uh, and then what else does it say? It says uh, CF and DG intersect at E. And at the bottom it says, all right, so if angle B, which is angle right here, if it's 75 degrees, let's include that. So if this is 75 then what? It says the measure of EF angle EFA is what? That is our objective for this problem. I'm going to put a little X right there. That's what we need to figure out together. All right, so uh, what do we know exactly? Well, this is a parallelogram, and I'm thinking about the properties of parallelograms, and among them is that the opposite sides are parallel, right? And so segment DC and AB are parallel to one another, and segment uh, CB is acting like a transversal. And so what do we know about that? Well, we know that if this is 75, then this angle right here has got to be what? It's got to be 105 because why? Because, of course, they are supplementary. Tremendous. And if we just saw a moment ago that uh, we said that uh, segment CF bisects it, we can then divide 105 by 2, and that makes sense, and that gives us what now? This angle right here is 52.5, and likewise, this angle is 52.5. And uh, we are right on the way to figuring this out, and so I'm going to draw uh, segment CD and AB again, and I can see that now I'm looking at this transversal right here, CF. And what do we know about this angle and this angle? And I'll indicate that right here. Well, we know that this angle is congruent to this angle. So if this angle is, you know, 52.5, then this angle is also 52.5. And I'm going to write that right now. And that's, you know, critical. All right, so if this is 52.5, again, because of these are um, alternate interior angles are congruent, what can we identify? Well, I see that um, angle AFE and EFG form a linear pair. So these two are supplementary. These two angles add up. So 180, so how can we figure out the uh, measure of angle EFA? Well, I know that if we do 180 minus 52.5, that's going to give us what exactly? That gives us 127.5. This is our answer. Question number eight, what is the equation of a line that is perpendicular to the line whose equation is 2y plus 3x equals 1? The critical language in this problem is perpendicular. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to figure out what the slope is for this equation and then uh, find the opposite reciprocal, which is one of these four options. Uh, let's begin. So I'm going to rewrite this equation, 2y plus 3x equals 1, and we're going to isolate y. And to do that, I'm going to subtract 3x from one side. Got to do it to the other. And so now we've got 2y equals negative 3x plus 1. Uh, now we're going to divide both sides by 2. And we've got what? We've got y equals 
negative 3 halves x plus 1 half. All right. And so the only thing that we need to be thinking about is the slope. And so the slope of this equation right here is a negative 3 halves. And if we're looking for the perpendicular slope, I know it's the opposite reciprocal. So the uh, slope of the original equation is negative 3 halves. The opposite reciprocal, the perpendicular slope, is going to be not negative, but positive 2 thirds. Um, and when we look at the four options, is this among them? Yeah, absolutely. So the correct answer is number one, because this equation has a slope of positive two, thir two thirds, which is exactly what we're looking for. Question number nine says, which sequence of rigid motions will prove that triangle ABC is congruent to RST? And this is asking us which transformations will map triangle ABC onto this triangle down here. Let's take a look at our four options. Number one says, a line reflection over Y equals X. And we know that that line looks a little something like this. And if we were to reflect triangle ABC over this line, it would give us uh, this image. And this is not what we're looking for. It's certainly not an RST. So we can eliminate option one as a possibility. Let's take a look at option two. It says a rotation of 180 degrees centered at one comma zero. So it's not going to be centered at the origin. Instead, it's going to be centered all right, right there. And uh, let's rotate 180 degrees around this point. I know that this is about 90 degrees right there. And we've got 180 right here. And would you look at that? That looks perfect. In fact, this is the correct answer, option number two. Uh, but you know, let's take a look at options three and four, and uh, let's do that right, right now. So it says, option three says, a line reflection over the x-axis followed by a translation of six units right. All right, so let's let's um, do that together. So if, if it's going to be reflecting over the x-axis, you can see that the x-axis is right here. All right, and now it's going to be shifting six to the right. Let's do that together. One, two, three, four, five, six. Nope, that certainly doesn't work. Let's uh, eliminate three. And let's take a look at option number four. So option four says a line reflection over the x-axis followed by a line reflection over y equals one. All right, let's, let's uh, do that together. So um, as we did a moment ago, it's a reflection over the x-axis. All right. And now it's followed by a line reflection over y equals 1. So I know that y equals 1 is this line right here. And so we'll do that right now. There's, there's y equals 1. Boom. And so clearly um, that's not mapping onto RST. So the correct answer is option number 2. Question number 10. If the line represented by y equals negative one fourth x minus two is dilated by a scale factor of four, that's critical. So I'm going to highlight this and uh, centered at the origin. That's also important. Then what? It says which statement about the image is true? And we've got four options. And right off the bat, I know that when I'm looking at this um, equation right here, if it's being dilated, then the slope remains the same. And so when I look at the slope of these four options, so it could potentially be, I'm looking at uh, option one, two, three, and four. I can see that for option three and four, it's got a slope of negative one and negative one, and that does not work. That does not make sense. So we're gonna eliminate options three and four, because again, the slope has gotta be the same when we're dilating um, a line. And so now we're going to draw our attention to where the location is of the y-intercept. So if it's being dilated by a scale factor of 4, and I'm going to loosely draw this on this graph right here, um, the y-intercept is negative 2. So it's going to look more or less something a little bit like that. And if uh, it's being dilated, then this line is going to be, from the origin, and it's going to be shifted down um, to negative 8, and I know that because we're going to be multiplying the original y-intercept, which is negative 2, by 4. And that would mean that the correct answer is option number 1.
the y-intercept is negative 8, and the slope is negative 1 fourth. Question number 11 says, square METH has a side length of 7 inches. You know what, let's diagram that right now. Alright, so here we've got a square, and uh, I know that this is METH, and it says that the side lengths are 7 inches each. Alright, so this is 7, likewise this, this, and this, and it says, which three-dimensional object will be formed by continuously rotating math, the square right here, around side AT. All right, so the most important side is this one right here. And it says uh, it's going to create a 3D object rotating around TH. Which is it possibly? So you know what, let's, let's do that right now. And I know that it's going to look a little something like this. So if it's going to be rotating around TH, it's going to look a little bit like this. All right. Uh, and so, what are our options? We've got either a cone, a cylinder, a cone, or a cylinder. This green 3D object is clearly not a cone, so we're going to eliminate option 1 and 3. And so is it 2 or 4? Does it have a diameter of 7 inches or a radius of 7 inches? Clearly it has a radius of 7 inches. The correct answer is number 4. Question number 12. Hey, we've got a circle with a radius of 9, and the measure of the central angle, AOC, is 120 degrees. What is the area of the shaded sector of circle O? So we're looking for the area of this shaded sector. Where do we start? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look um, at AOC, and I can see that uh, this sector has an angle of 120 degrees. How do we figure out what the um, measure of this angle is right here? I know that Circle, obviously, is 360 degrees, so we're going to do 360 minus 120, and uh, the angle of the shaded area is 240 degrees. How do we figure, what's the formula to figure out the area of a sector? Well, I remember that it is the angle, I'm sorry, the area of a sector equals what? It's theta over 360, yikes times pi radius squared. And so now what we need to do is simply pop in relevant information. And I can see that uh, the area of the, the angle measure of the shaded area is 240 de degrees. And I can see that the radius is 9. And so when you pop that in your calculator, you're going to get 54 pi. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the answer. And it is option Number four. Question number 13. In quadrilateral QRST diagonals QS and RT intersect at M, which statement would always prove quadrilateral QRST is a parallelogram? All right, so we're trying to prove that this quadrilateral is a parallelogram, and how exactly are we going to do that? The first thing that I would urge you guys to do is sketch out this parallelogram, and I know that it's QRST. It's always helpful for me if I can visualize it, and I know that uh, the diagonals intersect at point M. Beautiful. All right. So before we can move on any further, you need to know, you must know, the properties of a parallel parallelogram. You must have these um, memorized. And I'm going to cut to the chase, and I'm going to tell you guys that the correct answer for number 13 is option 3, and here's why. It says that QR is congruent to TS, and I'm going to jot that down right now. I'm going to mark it up. So QR is congruent to TS, and I see that QT is congruent to RS. Beautiful. And so which of these five properties um, shares this criteria and, or shares this uh, attribute? And it's the first one. Both pairs of opposite sides of quadrilateral are congruent. That one right there. And so what we can do now is we can go through and we can um, analyze and eliminate the other three options. And so, for example, um, when we look at number one, it says that uh, angle TQR, which is this angle right here, um, and QRS are supplementary. That is not among the um, five attributes of a parallelogram. QM, 
which is, okay, this half of the diagonal is congruent to SM, and QT, which is this length right here, is congruent to RS, and again, we can eliminate that because um, that doesn't fall um, along any of the criteria of properties of parallelogram. And then finally, option number four, it says QT is congruent to TS, I'm sorry, QR is congruent to TS, which is true, and QT, which is this one right here, is parallel to RS. And so here's the thing, um, that can easily be uh, confused with this fourth bullet right here. One pair of opposite sides of quadrilateral are congruent and, let me let me highlight that, and parallel. So that's not the case. These are two separate um, pairs of um, opposite sides, both QR and ST and QT and RS. So we can eliminate also option number four. Again, three is the correct answer. Question number 14. A standard size golf ball has a diameter of 1.68 inches. The material used to make the golf ball weighs 0.6523 ounces per cubic inch. What is the weight to the nearest hundredth of an ounce of one golf ball? So the first thing that we're going to need to do is find the volume, and then we're going to need to determine the weight. So the question is, what is the formula for the volume of a sphere? Well, you actually don't have to have this memorized, because if you check out the back of the uh, reference table in your regions test, you're going to see, if you scroll down a little bit, and if you uh, look right here, you'll notice that the formula is 4 thirds pi r cubed. All right, so let's apply that right now um, to this problem. And I'm going to rewrite that formula, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Great. And what do I know now? I know that they don't give us the radius. Instead, they give us the diameter, and which is point. Uh, 168 inches, and I know that if we cut that in half, that's going to give us 0.84. Great. And so now when you use your handy dandy calculator, you're going to determine that the volume of this golf ball is 2.4827 inches cubed. Great. Um, and you know what, ladies and gentlemen, that looks... That looks pretty close to option number three, but do not be confused because that's not the answer. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're looking for. We're looking for the weight. And so how do we determine the weight? Well, what we need to do now is multiply this by, um, it weighs 0.6523 ounces per cubic inch. We figured out how many cubic inches this golf ball is. So we can simply multiply this by 0.6523. And that gives us 1.62. And is that an option? Yeah, it's option number two. That is our correct answer. Question number 15. Chelsea is sitting eight feet from the foot of the tree. All right, so let's, let's mark this up. So this Chelsea character sitting eight feet from the base of this tree. And it says, from where she is sitting, the angle of elevation of her line of sight to the very top of the tree, which is about right here, is 36 degrees. All right, so this is going to her line of sight. And we can extend this from here to the tree as well. And I can see that it's 36 degrees. All right, and it says if her line of sight starts 1.5 feet above the ground. All right, so this from here to here, Oops, from here to there is 1.5 feet above the ground. How tall is the tree to the nearest foot? All right, so that, ladies and gentlemen, is our objective. The first thing that we're going to need to do is figure out what the height of the tree is from the very top of it, which is right here, all the way down to her uh, line of sight, to her eye level. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add that additional one and a half feet to figure out the total uh, height of this tree. And so I recognize that this is a right angle. And so we're going to need to be using a little bit of trig ratios. And I'm thinking, uh, what is the relationship between Chelsea's line of sight and um, this side of the triangle right here? This is the adjacent side. You know, I'm going to mark this up as well. So this is the adjacent side. And this side is the opposite side. So we're going to be using 
tangent. So let's let's start let's start writing this out. And I know that if it's tangent tan of 36 degrees equals what? So it's going to be opposite over adjacent, and so it's going to be x over 8. And then we need to isolate x, and when we do that, we've got x equals 8 tan 36. And when we pop this in our calculator, we're going to get x equals 5.81 feet. All right. And um, I recognize that the question is asking us how tall is a tree to the nearest foot. And 5.81 sure does round up to 6, but uh -oh, we cannot forget this additional height from the ground itself to Chelsea's um, eye line. So we need to add an additional 1.5 feet. So let's uh, let's scratch out option number 3 so we can rule out rule that out. And if it's at least 5.8 feet, then we can also rule out option number 4. And so let's add 1.5 feet to 5.81. And what do we get? We get just about 7 feet, and that is option number 2. Question number 16. In the diagram below of right triangle ABC, altitude CD intersects the hypotenuse AB right here at D. So before I go any further, I'm going to mark up this diagram, and I know that this is a right triangle, and I can see that here we've got an altitude, which we know cuts across and creates a 90 degree angle. And uh, what is the significance of this? Well, whenever we have a right triangle, as we have here with an altitude, it creates three separate triangles, all of which are similar to one another. So this small triangle is similar to the medium triangle, which is similar to the large triangle, great. And so it's asking us which equation See, we've got um, some proportions beneath us. It says, which equation is always true? And uh, my strategy is to um, separate this into two separate triangles. And sometimes they'll be overlapping if it's like the medium triangle and the large triangle. In this case, they're not overlapping. And I'm going to draw the triangle on the right first. So I see that we've got B, D, C. All right, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this smaller triangle. Okay, and we've got A, D, B. Uh. So the correct answer of these four options are going to be the one where the corresponding sides of these two similar triangles are proportional. We'll start with option number one, and I can see that it says AD, which is the short side, over AC, which is the hypotenuse short side over the hypotenuse equals CD over BC. CD is the short side over the hypotenuse BC. Wait a second, that looks good. In fact, that checks out. Option number one has got to be the correct answer. But you know what, let's take a look at another example. We'll take a look at um, option number four just so we can rule it out. And I can see that it says um, AD which is the short side again, over AC, all right, which is again is the hypotenuse, over AC, which is the small triangle, over BD, which is this triangle right here. So that doesn't make sense, right? So we can easily rule that out. Um, those sides aren't proportional to similar triangles. We'll look at one more um, option just for good measure. We'll take a look at option number three. And so I see it says AD, which once again is that short side over CD, which is the long side. So you see green, green equals BD, which is the long side now over CD, which is the short side. And so when we look at the green, right, it looks like it matches up. So I see the short side, the long side, the short side, the long side. However, um, they are not consistent because very quickly, I can see that AD is the short side. So we'll do the short side over the long side equals BD, the long side over the short side, that does not check out. So we can eliminate option uh, number two. And you know, how, how exactly does option one check out? So it says AD, which is the short side, over AC, which is the hypotenuse, equals CD, the short side over uh, BC, which is the hypotenuse. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why option number one 
is the correct answer. Question number 17. Here we've got a countertop for a kitchen modeled with the dimensions shown below. An 18 by 21 inch rectangle will be re removed for the installation of the sink. And it says, what is the area of the top of the installed countertop to the nearest square foot? So we're going to be looking for the shaded area. And we'll start with um, this region right here. So we're going to be looking for this section. And I know that we can simply multiply 2 by 8, giving us... 16 cubic feet and this area right here is clearly two feet two times five nope i know that if this whole thing is five feet right here right and this is two then this has got to be three so two times three is six 16 plus six is going to give us 22 cubic feet all right and so that's the shaded, I'm sorry, that's the whole area, but um, don't be confused because we need to now remove uh, this section right here. So we can eliminate option number three. And so how exactly do we do this? Um, ladies and gentlemen, I can see that this is in inches where everything that we've been working on previously has been in feet. So we're going to have to uh, convert it. And I know that uh, 21 inches is 1.75 feet and I know that 18 inches is 1.5 feet it's one and a half feet so when we multiply 1.75 times 1.5 that's going to give us 2.625 cubic feet and so now what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to subtract this from uh, 22 feet and when we do that that's going to give us a grand total of 19.375 feet squared. And is that an option? If we're going to be uh, looking for the area to the nearest square foot, that's clearly going to be option number four, 19. Question number 18 in the diagram below. BC connects points B and C on the congruent sides of isosceles triangle ADE such that triangle ABC is isosceles with vertex angle A. All right, and so it says if AB equals 10, and let's mark this up right now, and BD equals five, and DE equals 12, what is the length of BC? All right, how do we approach this? What do we need to know? Well, I remember that isosceles triangle, which is what ABC is, and ADE, that share a same vertex are similar. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a proportion between the smaller triangle and the larger triangle to solve for X. And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm just gonna illustrate. So we're gonna set up a proportion between like the smaller red triangle and the larger blue triangle. And so what exactly will that look like? So I'm gonna do the side length, which is 10 over the base x equals the side length, and I can see that here, it's this whole length, so it's gonna be 10 plus five, which of course is 15, over, what is the base? It's 12, and so now we're gonna simply cross multiply, and when we do, that's gonna give us 15x equals 120. And now we need to simply divide both sides by 15, and x, equals eight. Is that an option? It sure is. It's option number three. BC is eight. Question number 19. In this triangle ABC, angle C is a right angle, and you're going to need to identify which of these four statements right here is true. And so a moment ago we said that C is 90 degrees. That means that A plus angle B has got to equal 90 degrees. That means that they are complementary and we're going to be needing to use our trig ratios to set up and solve this problem and so let's jump right on in and so if we're looking at for example um, sine of a right now I'm going to plug in sine of a and we're looking right here and we need to we know that it's opposite over hypotenuse so opposite is 12 over the hypotenuse which is 13 so sine of a equals 12 over 13 and the cosine of b 
which is adjacent over hypotenuse. We are looking from this perspective right here, and adjacent is 12, and the hypotenuse is 13. And well, what do you know? Cosine of B equals also 12 over 13. And you know what? That matches up, meaning that option number one is the correct answer. If we were to look at, for example, um, let's take a look at option two for a moment. That way we can rule it out. So we just said that sine of A is 12 over 13 a moment ago. And so I'll, I'll jot that down right here. And if we're going to be looking at the tangent of B, and we remember that tangent is opposite over adjacent, and so the opposite of uh, tan B is what? It's going to be 5 over 12. Does that match up? It certainly does not. So we can rule out option 2. Likewise, for 3 and 4, option 1 is the correct answer. Question number 20. In right triangle RST, altitude TV is drawn to the hypotenuse RS. So before we go on any further, we're going to need to sketch this out, and I would urge you guys to do the same. All right, and so we've got RS, which we said is the hypotenuse, and we've got this altitude that's extending from T to V, and we know that creates a 90-degree angle, and this whole triangle is a right triangle. I can see that because it says it right there, beautiful. And so what is the significance of this? Well, I know that whenever we have a um, right triangle, as we have in this case with an altitude, that's going to create three separate and unique similar triangles. So we've got this small triangle is similar to this medium-sized triangle, which is similar to the large triangle. And so let's go ahead and label this diagram. And I know that it says that RV is equal to 12. And you know, let's label this part right here. So RV is equal to 12. And RT is equal to 18. All right. Our objective is to figure out the length of SV. And I can see that SV is right here. All right. So what we need to do is we're going to set up proportions so we can think about corresponding sides and we can solve for X. And what I like to do, um, especially for this kind of problem, is um, think about what are the triangles that we're going to be um, setting similar to one another. And I can see that it's going to be the small triangle because we've got this short length and the hypotenuse. And the big triangle, which is the short length, which is the short side rather, and the hypotenuse. And because they overlap, it's going to be easier for me and probably for you to visualize if we sort of separate these overlapping triangles. All right, so I've got R, V, T. I know that this is a right angle. And we said a moment ago that the short side is 12. The long side, or the hypotenuse rather, is 18. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the large triangle. And we're going to flip it. All right. And so I can see that, of course, this is T. I can see that this is S. And this is R. RT is 18. And I can see that when we're looking at the hypotenuse of the big triangle, RS, it's 12 plus X. And we can simply write that 12 plus X. Great. And so now what we need to do is we're going to set up a proportion. And uh, what exactly is that going to look like? Well, we can set it up like RS over RT equals RT over RV. And RT is the geometric mean between these two triangles. And so now we can simply plug in this information and uh, let's set up this proportion. So RS, of course, is 12 plus X. RT is 18, RT is 18, and RV is 12. And so what do I know? I know that uh, 18 times 18 is going to give us 324, and we've got 12 times 12 plus X, which is going to give us what exactly? 144 plus 12X. And now we need to simply subtract 144 from both sides. And that's going to give us 180 equals 12x. And when we divide both sides by 12, 
x equals what? It equals 15. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the answer. Is that an option? When we look at our four options, it certainly is. The correct answer for number 20 is option number 2, 15. Question number 21. What is the volume in cubic centimeters of a right square pyramid with base edges that are 64 centimeters long and a slant height of 40 centimeters? Well, what I'm going to do right now is simply label um, this diagram, and I can see that the slant height is 40. I can see that the base edges are 64 all the way around because this is a square, a right square. And, uh, and now I'm going to recall that the formula for the volume of a pyramid is one-third base times height. So we can figure out what the base is. We do not know what the height is, and that is our primary objective. And we remember that the height extends from the apex to the center of the base. And I know that because this is a right square, it's going to form a 90 degree angle right here. Oh, and what, I, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to label this, and I know that the slant height of this triangle is remains 40, but the um, the base of this triangle is not 64. It's half of 64, right? It's simply 32. And so our objective is to figure out what the height is. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to apply the Pythagorean theorem to determine the length of x, the height. All right, so let's do that right now. I remember that the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, in this case, a squared is going to be 32 squared plus, we don't know what the height is, so we're going to leave it as b squared, equals the hypotenuse 40 squared. And 32 squared is simply 1024 plus b squared equals 1600. We need to isolate b, so we're going to subtract 1024 from both sides. And b squared equals 576. And then I know that we need to uh, simplify b, and we get radical 576. And can we simplify that further? We sure can. Um, and that would be b equals simply 24. Great. So if b is 24, what we're going to have to do now is plug that into our formula for volume. And uh, let's do that. Let's shift this over here. Okay. So volume equals one-third. What is the base? The base is going to be 64 because, again, this is a right uh, square pyramid. It's going to be 64 times 64 or simply 64 squared. Let's go back. There we go. Times what? Times the height, which we now know is 24. And when you plug that into your calculator, the volume is 32,768. Is that an option? It sure is. The correct answer is option three. Question number 22. It says, in the diagram below, we've got chords PQ and RS intersecting at T. And we're asked, which relationship must always be true? And so when we take a look at our four options, I can see it says RT, which is this length right here, is equal to TQ. And, you know, theoretically, that could be true, but this diagram is not labeled, and we're looking for something that's always true. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to eliminate option one as a contender for the correct answer. And we can do that similarly for question two. And so that leaves options three and four. And what I need you guys to remember is the intersecting chords theorem, which says that um, A times B equals C times D. And when we look at options three and four, I can see that RT, which is this segment right here, plus this equals this plus this. And so that doesn't um, adhere to the intersecting chords theorem, but option four does, and let's, let's label that right now. And I can see it says RT, which is this length right here, times TS, which is this length right here, um, equals this length times this length, and this matches. So the correct answer for number 22 
is option three. Let's take a look at question number 23. It says a rhombus is graphed on the set of axes below. And the question says, which transformation would carry the rhombus onto itself? What exactly does that mean? Well, when you perform one of the, the transformations, rotation, reflection, dilation, or translation, that it's going to look as it originally did, that it's going to map onto itself. And we'll start with option number one, which says a 180 degree rotation counterclockwise about the origin. And so let's do just that. So if it's rotating 180 degrees, we know that 90 degrees is going to be about right there, yes? 180 degrees is going to be here. Does this look like it's mapping onto itself? Certainly does not. So we're going to eliminate option one as a possibility. Let's take a look at option number two. So it's a reflection over the line y equals one half x plus 1, you're going to definitely want to graph out this line as I did here. And when we reflect over this line, it's going to give us uh, this orientation clearly. It does not look the same as it did originally, so we can scratch option 2 as being one of the possible answers. Let's take a look at option number 3. It says a reflection over line y equals 0. So where does y equals 0? It equals it here, 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 and here. And in fact, all along the x-axis. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw a line along this axis. Beautiful. And uh, let's reflect over it. And when we do, we're going to get something that looks a little bit like this. No, again, this, uh, this certainly does not work. So we can eliminate option 3 as a possibility. That leaves only option 4. Let's see what that looks like. All right. So here we have this orange rhombus, and it says it's a reflection over the line x equals 0. So that's going to be a vertical line. So x equals 0 here and here and here and here. In fact, I'm going to draw that line. Beautiful. And uh, let's reflect over it. Beautiful. And yes, there we go. Um, this is mapping right onto itself and we can see that so that the correct answer is option number four, a reflection over the line x equals zero. Question number 24, we've got a 15 foot ladder leaning against the wall and making an angle of 65 degrees with the ground. So let's, uh, let's sketch this out. I'm going to start with the ground and then uh, we'll, draw, we'll draw the wall. All right, here we got this, we got this wall and we've got a ladder leaning against it. And it's uh, a 15 foot ladder. Amazing. And it's making an angle of 65 degrees. Tremendous. It says then, what, what is the horizontal distance? All right, that's crucial. In fact, that is our objective for this problem. What is the horizontal distance from the wall to the base of the ladder to the nearest foot? So what we need to do is we need to solve for x. Great. And so we're going to need to apply our trig ratios with this problem. And I know that because this, of course, is a right angle. And so we're going to think about our three options. This, we're going to be using sine, cosine, or tangent. And if we're looking at this from the perspective of this corner right here, 65 degrees, I can see that one side is the adjacent side. And we don't want the opposite side. Instead, we want the hypotenuse. And of our three options, what we're going to need to do is apply the cosine right here. And so I'm going to write the cosine of 65 degrees equals adjacent over hypotenuse. And in the context of this problem, it's going to be x over 15. And we're going to need to isolate x. And to do that, we're going to multiply both sides by 15 so that we get, actually, we'll do that right now. Multiply both sides by 15. So now we've got x equals 15 cosine 65. When you pop that into your handy dandy calculator, you're going to get um, 6.33927. And I remember that the question is asking us to uh, round to the nearest tenth of a foot, which means that the correct answer for option number, I'm sorry, correct answer for problem 24 is 6.3.